we'll start with Rick Janice up for our song. Oh, the magic of singing. Do it. <laughs> okay, thank Something you. Something easy now, Janice. Remember the words. <laughs> <laughs> okay, there, there are no words on your table, so this is one you, you're supposed to know, right? Okay, so it's, my eyes have seen the glory, the glory, hallelujah. You got it? Yeah. Sing it with enthusiasm. So here's your pitch. Here we go. Pick, pick one. Okay, here we go. Ready? Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. He is trampling out the vintage where the grants of grants are stored. He hath loosed the faithful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching. Oh, you now, chorus. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Glory, glory, hallelujah. Big it finish. Glory, glory, hallelujah. His truth is marching. Oh, and I'll put the words on the table next time. Thank you. <laughs> Or we just have you do the solo. <laughs> Michael Spangberg has a look. Place flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Mike Bailey has our invocation. Would you would bow your head? Dear Heavenly Father, we pause and acknowledge you lord we just give thanks for this food the freedom that we have here together together i ask you to bless each household met here represented and uh, lord guide us in the things that we do may our work through rotary and through our families and friends and uh, workplace be pleasing to you and that you get the glory we pray to you in jesus name amen amen, amen. amen. Wayne Underwood has our introduction of guests. Good to have everybody here tonight. Always good to see our numbers looking good here. Getting back to the way it used to be, which is great. Uh, we have two visiting Rotarians today, uh, both from the North Knoxville Club, uh, Don Haynes and Larry May. several guests today. Ray Fisher has a guest, right? Yeah. I'll let him tell you kind of what he does. Hi, I'm Joe Ferrero. We have lived in Knoxville since 1989. I have three children that have graduated. We've got my, my daughter's a doctor, um, son's a pilot with Delta, and my other daughter's a pediatric nurse with um, Schultz Pediatric. Um, I work with New York Life. I'm an agent with New York Life. And then my wife owns a, um, a marketing, um, the screen printing and embroidery, and then marketing tools for local businesses here in Knoxville. Been in business for about 23 years. So, anyway, thank you all for having us. Yeah. Thank you, Drew McDonald has a good Zach Lemons, and he is our chief financial officer. Thank you. 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 Uh, also from Knoxville. Went to Carnes High School. My whole family's from that area. I graduated from UT. I've been in finance about 20 years at Clayton and Malibu Boat, so local businesses. Um, and uh, I just, uh, you know, watch from afar and really admire Rotary and everything that you guys do. I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Yay! Terry has a guest. Yes, you all might know David Bailoff, especially y'all probably remember his, his dad, Sam. Uh, native of La Follette, past Rotarian. Uh, that was the past Rotarian, La yeah. Follette. Yeah, La Follette. Very good. La Follette. So, an elite group. If we play our cards right, right. this might just be a new member. Very good. 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 Service reports, uh, Dennis, is there a mobile meals report today? Uh, mobile meals are delivered today, and um, I just wanted to tell you, they always send their thanks to you delivering these mobile meals to them. They appreciate them. We're still in the salad phase for the summer, but we'll be starting the hot meals uh, in about a month. And so if you'd like to be part of the delivery team, just let me know, and I would be happy to have you sign up. All you have to do is go with me or go with someone who delivers 
raid delivers, and um, and we can show you the ropes, and then you can go by yourself, and you will be totally blessed. Um, every, when you go, uh, every Friday I, I see something that makes me very humble for where I am in my life and, and for what these lovely people do for me. They always have a smile, and, um, and we appreciate them very much. So let me know. Thank you. Thank you, Janice. Uh, Pie Gap update. Um, we hosted a, a pizza dinner for the faculty and staff of Pine Gap on Wednesday afternoon around 3 o'clock. They're getting ready for parent night. First day of school was yesterday. First full day of school is today. So uh, they really appreciate that. They helped them transition from their work day into the meet the parents night. And uh, they're real, real excited about our reading program starting back on September the 6th. And there should be a sign up going around. We have uh, two out of the four uh, readers for each day uh, through September. But we, but we can accommodate four. So if there's a few extra people on each uh, Friday go ahead and sign up. It's uh, very rewarding to read to kindergarten and first grade students. Drum row for Doug Coast and Top Gun. This flyer, we're going to do a semi fundraiser September 19th from noon to three, lunch is included. For any type of golfer, if you've never golfed, still come out. It'll be a great event. If you guys are interested, just give this back to me and we've got about a month to get some teams together. So appreciate it. Also, uh, James Burns, Burns is not here, but he wanted me to remind you, if you have not signed up for the, the ball board, uh, it's not too late. We just need a, a, the board filled by the end of the month, August 30th. So if you're interested in picking up a few spots, if you played in the past, just see Jim currently on the sign-up sheet here next week. Also, tomorrow is the Vibrant Club Workshop, presented by the district. will be held at uh, Mississippi State uh, from 8 to news and it's um, a great event so any Rotarians invited come and participate in that. Janice Hope, our newest members, has a birthday on the 17th. Today is only the 9th but uh, Mark Morell is sitting right there. I <laughs> forgot. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday dear Mark. Happy birthday, birthday to you. Yay. Thank you. One thing we have One thing I mentioned, uh, meant to mention last week, uh, a few of our club members have some extraordinary membership anniversary. Drew, 38 years this month. Wow. Thank you. Jim Keyes, 21 in this club. Uh, he, he was in the South Knoxville Club before transferring here. Martin is celebrating his first anniversary with our club that has a history with the downtown, downtown river. So those are our membership anniversaries for the month. Any else, anything else from the floor for the goodness of the club? If not, I'll bring JP up to introduce our, our program today. All right, our speaker today is a radio host, public speaker, history professor, and author. Uh, his radio show, The Leading Edge with Dr. Tim Holder, features interviews with leaders from a variety of fields uh, and is also a podcast. He speaks about 50 times a year to civic groups, businesses, churches, and schools. He teaches online for Liberty University and Walter State Community College. He's written more than 15 books. His most recent is called Forged in Fire and Hope. It's about the religious views of five early presidents. He's married to Jill Holder, an actress and producer and public speaker with many credits to her name. And fun fact, they have actually been on stage at the same time acting together. Please welcome Dr. Holder. Okay, it is good to be back here. I've been here twice before, and what I talk about is early presidents and how they handle adversity and what we can learn from them. And so the four presidents I'm going to talk about today are Andrew Johnson, James Monroe, George Washington, and Theodore Roosevelt. Andrew Johnson was uh, a really incredibly skilled politician until he wasn't. And then the one time he wasn't, things blew up kind of spectacularly. James Monroe had a challenge. His adversity was something that perhaps many of us have dealt with at some point in our lives. He had the challenge of following greatness. 
for George Washington. He had uh, to struggle with some pretty low self-esteem in the year of 1755, and so I want to tell that story. And then I want to end with a story about Teddy Roosevelt being Teddy Roosevelt. So first, Andrew Johnson. Andrew Johnson came from an incredibly poor family. And what that did for him was it gave him the ability to connect with poor working class whites. And he became a very successful politician because he knew how to speak to the people in a way that they could relate to. And so first in Greenville, Tennessee, he got elected to a few different offices, and then he got elected on the state level, and then he got elected to national office. And as some of you might remember from school, if you grew up in Tennessee, when the uh, southern states began to leave the Union, Andrew Johnson was the only politician from a Confederate state who didn't resign from his office and go home. He continued to serve the country. And so in 1864, when Abraham Lincoln was up for re-election, the Republican leadership thought, hey, we could use this Andrew Johnson guy to project an image of unity to the country. We've got Lincoln, this Northern Democrat, and Andrew Johnson, excuse me, Lincoln, a Northern Republican. Yeah, and Andrew Johnson, a Southern Democrat, and we could put them on the same ticket and that could really send a message to our Civil War-torn country that, hey, we're all Americans, we can all pull together, and our party represents that. And you might think, wow, it sure would be weird to have a president from one party and a vice president from another. But in 1864, they figured, constitutionally, the vice president only has two jobs. Take over if the president dies, and they certainly did not anticipate that Lincoln would be assassinated. They figured he's a healthy guy. If he gets reelected, he'll serve four more years. So they figured that won't be an issue. And the only other thing the vice president would have to do is break tie votes in the Senate. But they figured the Senate was dominated by Northern Republicans. There probably wouldn't be any tie votes. So they figured Andrew Johnson can't hurt us. He'll just be a symbol of unity. So Johnson agreed to this. And of course, Lincoln gets reelected. Inauguration Day rolls around in 1865. And Andrew Johnson is really sick. He's feverish. He's a little delirious. And so he tells people on Inauguration Day, hey, I can't get up and get around. I don't feel good. So all the parties and meetings and the big speech that I'm going to give, I'm just not going to do that. Give me a couple of days. Give me a couple of weeks. I'll feel better. I'll do whatever you want. Well, the Republican leaders said to him, we don't need you in a couple of days. We don't need you in a couple of weeks. We don't need you for the next four years. We just need you today to go out there and smile and be a symbol of unity. So they prop Andrew, uh, Andrew Johnson up, and somebody thought it'd be a good idea to give him some alcohol, that maybe that would brace him a little bit. But for this guy who was already feverish and delirious, it was not a recipe for success. And so he goes stumbling through his day, and he finally gets to the point where he's supposed to deliver this big speech and he kind of falls back to his stump speech that the working class poor whites of the South could relate to. And Andrew Johnson began to rail against the rich and the powerful. And he said, the problems that we have in America, it's all the fault of the rich and powerful people who don't care about the little guy. And he's giving his speech to a whole bunch of rich and powerful people. And given that he came across like he was a little drunk anyway, they really lost respect for him. And then it's not too long after this that Lincoln gets assassinated. And now you've got these Northern Republicans who won the White House, but they're stuck with a Southern Democrat. And it's really no shock that they ended up impeaching him. And so the lesson in adversity that we get from Andrew Johnson could perhaps be summed up by that great American poet, Clint Eastwood. <laughs> Sometimes a man's got to know his limitations. Sometimes when we're faced with adversity, we just have to say no when we've reached our limit. Okay, the next guy I want to talk about is James Monroe, and as I mentioned, his problem was he was following greatness. He was the fifth president of the United States. He followed Washington, Adams, Jefferson, and Madison. Washington was so widely admired by America that at one point we had four federal holidays in this country, Christmas, Easter, Independence Day, and George Washington's birthday. That was the pedestal he was on. Next president is John Adams, and I'm going to come back to him. Third president, Thomas Jefferson. He's widely beloved for the Declaration of Independence and declaring that all men are created equal. He was also very popular as president for the Louisiana Purchase. The Louisiana Purchase doubled the size of the country. 
It got France out of North America, so we didn't have to worry about them as a potential rival. Um, and all of that was accomplished without firing a shot. And Jefferson lowered taxes. What's not to love? And so as Jefferson is coming to the end of his time in office, he says, hey, America, you should vote for James Madison. He is the greatest man in the country. And given that a lot of people thought Jefferson was the greatest man, that was really high praise. But Madison was also beloved for being the father of the Constitution. And then, after he's elected president, we fight the War of 1812 and stand up to the British for the second time in a generation. Most powerful country in the world, but they didn't beat us. And so, Washington, Jefferson, Madison, they're all really widely admired. John Adams, founding father, patriot, was a better public speaker than any of them, so he could really stir up a crowd. And now you're James Monroe, and you've got to follow all of that awesomeness. How do you follow greatness? Well, Monroe shows up at his inauguration wearing the tri-cornered hat and the knickers, the pants that cut off at the knees, and that was a very fashionable look 40 years earlier. <laughs> it would be as if I walked in today and said, I'm going to talk to you about presidents, and I was dressed as if I just walked off the set of Miami Vice wearing my white suit and a pink shirt with no collar and called everybody pal or something. I mean, just hopelessly out of date. And he's elected president, he's inaugurated, and one of the first things Monroe does is he takes this walking tour, well, he, he didn't walk, he took this tour of all the states that we had back then. And it was a big deal because communication and transportation was so slow for a president to be gone that long and not at the White House or at his home, uh, that was a unique thing. But Monroe did it to promote unity in the country. He also did it because George Washington had done it. And Monroe really admired Washington. So Monroe's got all of this respect for tradition. How did Washington do it? How did Washington dress? But Monroe also gave us the Monroe Doctrine, which dealt with Latin America. The Latin American countries had recently gained their independence from Europe. The Monroe Doctrine said if any of those European countries tried to come back and conquer Latin America, the United States would fight them. And this was a radical departure from uh, the first four presidents their foreign policy was, we're not getting involved in anything, none of it is any of our business, we're just going to worry about the United States. And so Monroe, as a leader, had a lot of respect for tradition, but he was also willing to make bold change. And when we face adversity, we need to be flexible in that way to handle it however it's best to handle that situation. And we need to hear that because most of us lean pretty hard one way or the other. Most, and we've certainly seen this from politicians, from coaches, from businesses. They either want to keep doing things the same way, or they get somebody new in who just wants to change everything. It doesn't have any respect for the traditions that have worked for a reason. Like Blockbuster, wildly successful, and even made fun of Netflix when Netflix came along with a different way of letting people rent movies. But where's Blockbuster today? They kept doing things the way they'd been doing them, even when circumstances demanded something different. And so that's the lesson in adversity from James Monroe. When we're faced with adversity, we've got to be flexible. Maybe we need to be traditional. Maybe we need to be bold and change, and not just give in to our impulse to just always do it one way or the other. Next guy I want to talk about is George Washington. George Washington was a very unhappy man by the year 1755. When he was a kid, and I talked about this a little bit the last time I was here, how Washington's life unfolded. His dad was rich, he had land, he had money, and so young George Washington thought as a kid that he would grow up and enter the upper crust of Virginia society and uh, have an easy life. But his dad died when Washington was just 11 years old, and now all the land and money was split among Washington's family with his mom, but also older kids from a previous marriage and so Washington didn't have the wealth and opportunities that he would otherwise have. So what's he going to do now to make his mark in life? Washington's first plan was to join the Royal Navy because one of his brothers had done that and had uh, a lot of um, acclaim and achievement in the Navy, a lot of honor from his service there. So young George decided he would join the Navy and was so committed to this course of action that he packed his bags and he left home and he was headed to the coast. And someone told his mother, if you let George join the Navy, they will treat him worse than a dog. So she sent someone to go and get him, 
and say, you are not joining the Navy today, young man. You get yourself home. And like many teenagers whose parents don't support the dream, he was super frustrated with his mom, but he deferred to her wishes and went home. A few years later, he decides, I'm going to join the Royal Army, which is super weird to think about. Imagine the Revolutionary War going on and George Washington being a redcoat. That was actually his first plan. And so at that point in life, Washington had some connections with the rich and powerful in Virginia, and letters were written on his behalf, but the British just were not interested in him that way. Not even when a British general named Braddock came to Virginia with the plan of striking out west from Virginia and, in, and fighting the French and the Native Americans. George Washington went to Braddock and he said, look, you're hunting the French and the Indians. I have been out there on those trails. I have sat down and negotiated with the French and the Indians. I have fought them both. I'm your guy. Sign me up. Let me be a redcoat. And Braddock says, no, I will bring you along as a colonial guide and you're a Virginia militia man and that's great, you can wear your little militia uniform or whatever, but you're not going to be a redcoat. So there George Washington is, it's 1755, it's July, can't get in the Navy, can't get in the Army, his teeth hurt because they're already going bad, and life just isn't fair. It's like every door he knocks on, it doesn't open. So he's out there with Braddock and his army. They encounter the French and the Native Americans. Braddock gets killed. His officers get killed or wounded, and it's left to young George Washington, a guy in his early 20s, who's not even a member of the British Army. It's up to him, with his experience and leadership, to organize what's left of British forces and lead a retreat so they don't all get slaughtered. And as all of this is going on, Washington is on horseback, and his horse gets shot and goes down. He gets on another horse. That one gets shot and goes down. And so Washington is finally able to lead this retreat. And at the end of the day, when he takes his jacket off, he finds four bullet holes in his jacket. Six fatal shots that close to him, and he's totally unscathed. And he writes in a letter to one of his brothers after this that his only explanation for his survival was that God must have spared him for some kind of special purpose. And so George Washington goes from thinking, man, I'm a loser, nothing ever works out for me, to I am unique and special enough that God has a special mission for me. And that is a good thing for us to remember when life is beating us up, when we're feeling adversity, that we're still unique in the eyes of God, we're still special, like a fingerprint or a snowflake, or maybe a tattoo that you would get in prison. We're totally unique from any other that's kind of like it, we're special. Last guy I want to talk about is Theodore Roosevelt. <clears throat> Theodore Roosevelt uh, was Assistant Secretary of the Navy when we fought the Spanish-American War in 1898. Uh, a complaint that I've heard people make about warfare in American history is the politicians decide we're going to go to war, but it's the young men who go and fight and die in the wars. And if the politicians are so convinced that we need to go and fight, maybe they should go and fight themselves. But usually the politician would say, well, the job I'm doing is so important that I can do more good where I am. If anybody could make that argument, it might have been Theodore Roosevelt in 1898. He was the assistant secretary of the Navy, but his boss, the secretary of the Navy, didn't really care about the Navy. He liked having a fancy title. He liked going to important meetings and prestigious parties, but he didn't really care about the job. And in fact, he would usually leave early on Fridays so he could get a start on his weekend. But Theodore Roosevelt, as the assistant secretary of the Navy, once the boss was out of the office, Roosevelt would say, okay, I'm in charge, and now we're going to get some stuff done. Roosevelt saw that the British Empire was the most powerful in the world, even though it was just a tiny island nation, because they had the biggest navy. And he figured with our big country and our vast resources and uh, our connection to two oceans, we could really build up the U.S. Navy and become a world power. And so, once the boss would leave, Roosevelt would be sending messages to admirals and captains and firing off memos and sending out telegrams, moving ships around and calling for studies and uh, encouraging recruitment and doing whatever he could to build up the Navy. And then the boss would wander in on Monday morning and figure out slowly what Roosevelt had been up to, and then he'd have to decide, do I want to undo all that, or do I just want to leave it alone? And usually he would just leave it alone. 
So there's Roosevelt really making a difference. And once the war starts, the Spanish-American War, Roosevelt really could have rationalized, I can certainly do more work, more good, directing the Navy than I could as one individual military personnel. But that wasn't how Roosevelt thought. Roosevelt really admired his dad. And Roosevelt's dad was a great man in a lot of ways with one big regret. He was around during the Civil War, and he was a big supporter of the Union, and he was going to go and fight, but he married a Southern Belle. And she said to him, my brothers have joined the Confederate Army, and I can't bear the thought of you going off to war and maybe meeting them in combat and you guys shooting at each other. Please don't go and serve. And so Roosevelt's dad did not serve in that war, but he regretted that in his country's hour of need, he did not step up. And so Theodore Roosevelt did not want to live with that regret that his dad had. So he resigned from his office, joined the army, and certainly he could have used his connections to stay well behind the lines, but still go out and say on the campaign trail, hey, I went and served when my country needed me. But Roosevelt actually used his connections to get himself moved to the front line and won a medal for uh, valor in the face of enemy fire. And so the lesson in adversity that Roosevelt gives us is in times of adversity, especially, we need to lead by example. So there you go, four stories about presidents, um, four lessons in handling adversity from Andrew Johnson, know your limitations and be willing to say no, from James Monroe, be flexible, and lean into tradition or bold change, however the situation warrants. From George Washington, remember, even when life seems to be beating you up, you're still special. And from Theodore Roosevelt, got to lead by example, especially in tough times. I'm going to invite like two minutes worth of random presidential questions, but before I do, I'd like to offer a couple of commercials on my own behalf. One of them is, I do have some books over here. Uh, I do have a new one since last year. You heard that it was mentioned. It's Forged in Fire and Hope. It's a look at the religious views of five early presidents. Basically, it's the Mount Rushmore presidents and James Garfield. So Washington, Jefferson, Lincoln, and Theodore Roosevelt, plus James Garfield. If you're wondering, why Garfield? He's the only preacher to become a president. And so I knew that about him and thought, that sounds like an interesting story. So I did the research and put him in the book. The books are $15 a pop or two for $25, and because we live in a great time to be alive, I can even take credit card information on my phone in addition to cash and check. <laughs> Last uh, self-promotion here that I will do is if you know of another group, uh, another civic group, maybe like a lunch and learn where you're at, uh, where one of these adversity talks might be a good fit, that'd be great. I also do a talk on the faith of George Washington. I think it's a fascinating subject because people argue both sides of it. There's a lot of information there. Um, so, uh, come and see me afterwards, and maybe we can talk that out. Okay, two minutes, random presidential question, or trivia, what do you got? You know, I read that book, Imperial Cruise, about Teddy Roosevelt's daughter. That was just absolutely fascinating story about how she sort of stirred up all of that racial, international racial, I mean, it was crazy how they fought back then. Okay, so you said Roosevelt's daughter? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so Roosevelt's daughter, and I'm not familiar with that specific story, but Roosevelt was married to a woman. Uh, she gave birth and died right after that, and then Roosevelt married another woman and had a bunch of kids. And that oldest daughter, uh, Alice, had a whole bunch of money from her mother's side of the family and lived like a socialite and went kind of crazy and wild and was very um, untraditional, shall we say. And when the media would ask Roosevelt about her, he would say, look, guys, I can either be Alice's father or I can be president of the United States, but I cannot do both because they're both full time. <laughs> she was stirring stuff up. She lived to be 96 years old. She was born in 1884, three years after the gunfight at the OK Corral, horse and buggy age. She lived until 1980. So she could have watched Star Wars in the theater <clears throat> after being born during cowboy times. And that's just an amazing span of time. Um, so that's, she's fascinating. Okay, uh, give me another president. Uh, I go with Washington. Uh, what we were taught in history, correct me if I'm wrong, but right after the war, it would have been a perfect time for the military just to step in and take control of the country. The most impressive thing from what I was taught in history is Washington said that we fought for a freedom 
and uh, he basically stepped away and said, vote and elect president. Yeah, and, and the thing is, Washington had to deal with the fact that the Continental Congress didn't really trust him and the army. They wanted them to beat the British, but they were afraid about what would happen when they beat the British. Because historically, whenever a general had led a revolution, he'd always just kept power for himself. And in fact, I just finished a book on Benedict, and I finished reading, not writing, finished reading a book on Benedict Arnold, and it talked about how bitter he got, because he was a war hero in the early part of the war, but men were promoted over him, who he had been in charge of, and he was doing everything he could, even to the point of being injured in battle. And the reason these guys got promoted over him was because Congress wanted to be in charge of promotions, and you had guys who had no military experience at all, like John Adams, who was a brilliant guy, but who thought that, you know, an officer should be a man who was refined and had a knowledge of good literature. Um, and you know, <laughs> the military had a different perception of the needs that they felt from their generals. And so you had this disconnect, and, and so, the military was really frustrated. They weren't getting paid. They were going hungry. And so it would have been easy for them to rationalize overthrowing this Congress that didn't really understand things and making Washington their leader. And so Washington scuttled that. He wasn't a perfect man because nobody is, but he really was extraordinary. So yeah, George Washington. Really. Okay, I'm gonna sit down. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. Listen to those stories all day, I think so. Uh, on behalf of the Rotary Club, we present a book to Pi Gap in your honor, and we can place here in the front for human science. And uh, today is. Arashima. Arashima steals the sword of the wind. Sorry. So uh, I'd like for you to sign that, and uh, we also have a token of appreciation. Well, thank you. All right, I'd like to thank our, our guests today, Don, Don and Larry, David, for, for coming today. We've got Zach and, and Joe. We're, 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 we're soon. So, thank you. Hope to see you guys come back. Welcome to come visit any, any Friday. Next week's meeting is Mary India King Cannon. So, that I'll, I'll be in. Uh, another great program. So, uh, uh, looking around, see who has Smokey. Where's Smokey today? Smokey's on this table. So, Chris, if you'd like to lead us in a four way test of the things we think, say, or do. Four way test of the things we think, say, or do. First, is it true? Second, is it fair to all concerned? Third, will it build goodwill and better friendship? Fourth, will it be beneficial to all concerned? <laughs> yeah, so you